Thank you for coming and welcome to the Wilderness Issues Lecture Series, this year focused on conservation in a time of climate change. Uh, this series is co-sponsored by the Wilderness Institute and the Climate Change Studies Program and supported by a grant from the Cinnabar Foundation. So my name is Nikki Fear, and I'm the coordinator of the Climate Change Studies Program and one of the series coordinators. And I would like to alert you all to the fact that there's a poster board up there about the Climate Change Studies Program. So if any of you would like to get a minor in the Interdisciplinary Climate Change Studies Program, you can pick up some information about courses that are happening um, this summer and this fall and degree requirements. We have a couple of field courses offered this summer, one about energy and climate change, another about actually conservation and climate change, and then a whole bunch of classes in the fall as well if you want to follow up on more, with more education about climate change after this series. We hope you return next week. We're going to have a lecture by Courtney Flint. She's coming here from the University of Illinois. And she's going to be talking about bark beetle and community experiences with forest disturbance by insects. And she's done a lot of studies in Colorado and in Alaska, places that have seen massive forest change from beetles and has done a lot of work with communities, talking with them about how they interface with that forest change. Tonight, we have Gloria Flora here to speak about biochar, which is a really great way to concentrate carbon and put it back into the ground. So it's one of the few ways we can really modify the um, potential for overheating our planet. And um, where she's going to speak for about 50 minutes, 55 minutes till 8. And then, as usual, we'll have our 30-minute question and answer session. So please stay till the end of that. If you need to leave early, just do so quietly. Students, again, you hand in your papers and pick up your ones from last week. OK. So I get the pleasure of introducing Gloria Flora, who is a bold, visionary woman that's done a huge amount for conservation here in Montana. When Lori, Lori Young and I were um, envisioning this series and thinking about who to invite, Gloria was um, right at the top of my list, and the next day I went ahead and emailed her to ask if she would speak in this series. And then the very next day, I received this in the mail, and this is a flyer that includes a list of eco-speakers, speakers from around the nation that are um, that inform and inspire. It says, these people have informed and inspired millions with messages of hope and direction for the creation of a sustainable future. The speakers know that individuals can make a difference because they have made a difference. So on this list includes people like Dennis Hayes, who was the founder of the first Earth Day, Hunter Lovins, who's the co-author of the book Natural Capitalism, Lester Brown, who's the founder of the Earth Policy Institute, and Gloria Flora. <laughs> so I thought that was great coincidence there. So um, she's widely known for her leadership um, through her 23-year career um, in the Forest Service. She's well known for her work when she was forest supervisor on the Lewis and Clark National Forest, where she was successful in banning oil and gas um, leasing along the Rocky Mountain Front, a 100-mile strip there on the Rocky Mountain Front. And she did this because there was strong public support for preserving that area from energy development. And she listened to people and went to bat for the place and for the people who wanted that protected. She also made national headlines when she resigned as forest supervisor of the largest national forest in Lower 48, the Humboldt Toyobe, is that her? Toyavi, which is located mostly in Nevada and parts of Cal um, California. And she resigned to call attention to harassment and, to and intimidation that was happening to Forest Service personnel there. There was a big issue at that time um, around a road that had been closed. The Forest Service had closed it to protect bull trout habitat. And a bunch of people there, the sagebrush rebels, felt like they had the right to keep that open. They went in with picks and shovels and re tried to reopen that road, and in the process of all all of that was um, intimidating Forest Service employees, and Gloria resigned to call attention to that, and she was heralded by many for her stance on that. Um, today, she directs an organization called Sustainable Obtainable Solutions, or SOS, which she founded. It's a nonprofit dedicated to the sustainability of public lands and the plants, animals, and human communities that depend on them. 
Their current focus is large landscape conservation, climate change, and biochar. She's also the founding director of the U.S. Biochar Initiative, promoting the sustainable production and use of biochar, which we'll hear a lot more about tonight. She also related to climate change, Gloria has served on the Montana's Governor's Climate Change Advisory Committee with Steve Loken here. And um, she is a fellow with the Post Carbon Institute. And she's helped a lot of states develop climate action plans, including Alaska, um, Maryland, three Mexican border states. And then uh, tomorrow she's meeting with several community leaders and student leaders to help think about how Missoula might move forward developing a climate action plan. A report just came out just not too long ago that Missoula, our carbon, our greenhouse gas emissions went up by 46% between 2003 and 2008. So we have a lot of work to do there. Um, we are honored to have Gloria here. Um, I won't go into the list of awards, but I will say she got one of the ones of many, the Environmental Hero Award from Sunset Magazine. So please join me in welcoming Gloria, Gloria Flora. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, I so appreciate being invited to come and speak with you all. And thank you all for showing up. It's been such a lovely day today. I was um, totally amazed when I got over to this side of the hill. I live in Helena, and it was uh, zero when I left Helena. And so I was bundled up with 14 layers and heavy boots and all that. And I, uh, by the time I got to Missoula, I did feel rather foolish. <laughs> I looked like Nanook, and it was already in the almost 40. But um, been enjoying it myself. But anyhow, thanks for coming tonight. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to talk about one of my favorite subjects. Am I in the way here? Uh, kind of, sort of. Uh, you, you can, you'll get the picture. Um, uh, my head's not quite that big yet. Um, biochar. I learned about biochar about three or four years ago. I read an article about it, and I thought, <laughs> This must be snake oil because it promises to do all this wonderful um, climate mitigation and, and it helps soils and it, it, it helps the, the atmosphere and, and it sequesters carbon. And so I didn't really believe it until I started to really study it. And the science on it is pretty extensive and, and very hard to call into question. And, but what I did notice was that there was no one in the United States trying to coordinate all the grassroots efforts that are going on. That's another thing that's so exciting about biochar is that it's not something that's going to be co-opted by a corporation and centralized and then you're going to have to come crawling on your knees if you want the benefits. Instead, we can take control in our local in our local areas, and totally scalable, and so that's that's another exciting thing. Now let's see if I can drive. No, oh there, yeah, okay. Complex problems. Um, let me say at the outset, biochar is not the silver bullet. It's as Bill McKibben says, one of the silver BBs that's going to help us address climate change. Um, and what do I mean by complex problems? Well, obviously. One of the reasons we're here, that, that, that climate change has, is, is upon us, and it's a result of too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, in the active cycle. And a lot of that CO2 comes from burning fossil fuels, as you well know, um, methane from livestock and, and, um, and landfills, uh, nitrous oxide from off-gassing that comes from uh, fertilizers that are based in fossil fuels, and um, that those temperature and moisture changes as a result of what's happening in our atmosphere are affecting our plants' abilities to grow, or they grow differently and at different times than they used to. And then, um, and the insect life cycles. I, I don't think I need to tell anybody who lives in Montana about that. We can see evidence of that every day. And then also the 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 impacts that we are seeing and will be seeing from concentrated dead biomass. So what do I mean by the active cycle? You know, I, I don't want to belabor climate change because I, I would suspect that a number of you are not only have been to various lectures about that, but are, are probably self, by self-study experts in it yourself. But there are two parts to, um, to the carbon cycle, and what I call the active cycle and the inactive cycle. We are part of the active cycle. You know, if we're looking here at, oh, look, I, 
I have a little light. This is really exciting. Um, if we look at what we're part of, we're part of a, the soil, soil organic matter, the biomass. We're living here. Uh, we don't like this. We don't like that. OK, so um, off goes photosynthesis. The, um, Plants are, are um, giving off oxygen and taking in CO2. Plants die, we die, we, we give off the, the CO2 that we've been borrowing from the active cycle. But what we also have is the inactive cycle down here in the lithosphere, the crust of the earth, inactive. That's where the ancient sunlight is. That's where the dinosaurs and the, and the, the plants and the algae and all the things that are creating, that have created fossil fuels for, uh, for that we are now using are in the inactive cycle. That's where they were supposed to be. They were supposed to be staying there and not coming out at the rate at which we have been taking them out and combusting them. And so essentially what we're doing is simply overloading the active cycle with too much carbon dioxide. Other greenhouse gases too, but carbon dioxide is the, the largest in terms of volume. So we've, we've tipped the balance in nature by quite a bit and quite suddenly. And so that's the complex problem that we have. So when we talk about biomass, converting biomass to biochar, um, yes, we can claim it's carbon, uh, uh, that it is carbon negative and it is zero waste. That is a pretty tall claim because there are very few th things that we can do, particularly solutions to climate change, that are both um, carbon negative and zero waste. So, what is biochar? Well, here's one of those rude slides with a little tiny writing, and it's very complex, and it's a, a quite a long and very specific definition about biochar, but you don't have to read it because I'm going to translate it for you. What it simply means is that charcoal made from plant material or waste in a high temperature ovens with limited oxygen uh, when you put that the uh, resultant char in the soil, it will sequester carbon for thousands of years, and it's carbon negative because it holds carbon that would otherwise remain in the active carbon cycle. So biochar is taking the material that's already in biomass, the carbon that's already in biomass, and grabbing a hold of it, and then when you put it in the soil, it's very recalcitrant. I had to look that up the first time I heard it. It means it doesn't fall apart. Uh, um, and doesn't decay over time, um, or at least so that we'd notice. Um, and the other exciting thing about biochar is that it attracts and holds uh, nutrients in water. It makes them more bioavailable to plants, and that means we use less fertilizers, and that's over time. That, that's, that's not just this year and then you put more biochar and you, then you, protect, and then you um, hold those fertilizers that you put on this year and then you put it on again. No, you don't keep applying biochar to soil, although there have been studies that have shown up to 60 tons per acre of biochar can be applied before you see deleterious effects. So do not try that at home. That's a lot of biomass or biochar. But, um, and one of the other things that biochar does, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to all of this, but, but it also reduces the off-gassing of greenhouse gases, CO2, nitrous oxide from soils. That's a huge benefit. Okay, biochar, what does it look like? Yep, it's just charcoal. We, call, we add the bio when we stick it in the soil, but it's really, really porous. And this is the exciting thing about it. Do you know in a, in a, 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 a cubic centimeter of biochar, there are thousands of square yards of surface area. And that's pretty exciting. Oh, how is biochar made? Well, years ago, charcoal, this is charcoal making. It is messy, it is dirty, and it is really smoky. But we don't make it that way anymore. We use pyrolysis, and these are pyrolysis ovens. This is a whole tree a pyrolysizer, which is pretty wild. That's in New Zealand. Um, and this a friend of mine made up in, in, uh, in Calgary, and I have not been to visit that one yet. So um, that's pyrolysis. But what, what is pyrolysis? It's a way to thermally convert biomass without oxygen. The emissions are captured, and you get byproducts from it, liquids, syngas, charcoal. Now, what's the difference between combustion? Combustion is when you put the flame right to the biomass. You burn the material and in the presence of oxygen, create a lot of heat, obviously, but you get ash uh, is really what uh, is the end result and gases that, that escape off into the atmosphere. So, the products of pyrolysis, very specifically, what do we get out of it? Well, 
the fun thing is, is that you don't need different equipment to get these different products. You can get these different products from one piece of equipment, but it depends on how you adjust the temperature and the speed at which the, the material is subjected to the heat. If you go fast, like a gasification, oh, there's a big clue there, gas, um, syngas, which is, can be a substitute pr for propane. It doesn't have as many BTUs as natural gas does, but it, it is a suitable substitute for propane. You get very little char um, out of a, a, a syngas emphasis because it goes at a very high temperature, so that there's very little uh, char left. In mid-range temperature, you can focus on that, and you'll, you can get bio oil. You can get a lot of bio oil out of, out of um, biomass. It's really pretty amazing. And it's, it, you can sell that, and there is an active market right now for it. It's bunker fuel. It's very crude kind of oil, uh, very heavy oil. It's used in manufacturing, like um, a cement plants use a lot of bunker fuel. And it is a precursor to biodiesel, but right now it is not worth the energy return on energy invested um, to, make, to take that extra step to refine it to, bio to a, a biodiesel product. Um, so we don't recommend that. The biochar, soil amendment, carbon sequestration, and carbon credits, if, if uh, any of our leaders ever become more aware that a carbon market of some nature would be very, very beneficial and very helpful not only to the economy but to our, our natural economy, um, then we would have a, another, another uh, viable e economic benefit from biochar. Also heat, space heating, steam production, producing electricity. <coughs> And this unit right here that, that is behind us is, uh, is used for production of, of electricity and it's net metered back into the grid. And in Alberta, it's a, that's a very profitable thing to do. We find in the United States, and particularly in Montana, there are a lot of barriers to net metering. So we recommend the, that if you are making um, biochar on your own, that, that you look for a, an on-site use for the energy that you're creating rather than trying to stick it back into the net and, and uh, into the grid and then bring it back. Um, so, and very, very low emissions. Um, actually, when, when pyrolysis units are operating, you don't see any smoke, you don't see anything coming out of them at all. Okay. This is um, a, a more in-depth look at, at the, the pyrolysis process and what really happens to the carbon. Uh, we start over here with manure. Oh, not manure. Well, we don't have to start with that, but it's one of the biomasses that you can use. Any kind of organic waste, um, wood waste, <clears throat> construction waste that's of a, a um, organic origin, um, grasses, willows, uh, agricultural waste. Uh, I'll go into the list later. Um, but those can go into the pyrolysis unit, and uh, with you know 100% of their carbon intact, and then. When, when you're done with the charcoal, when, you, when you've created the charcoal, that's still holding 50% of the carbon that was in the original material, and then you put that back into the soil, and so you've essentially taken half of the carbon of that biomass and put it back in the, in the soil for, uh, for sequestration. And then, of course, the other, um, the other fuels that I mentioned, um, what they can be used for, transportation, energy, etc. The residual heat, you can bring the heat back in to help the process. You can also fire some of the syngas to help this process get going. Uh, you do start it with some external form of heat and that could be um, a propane, a gas, a, or, or more wood. And, um, and so in the end, through your, um, you can pull off 75% of the energy, you get a 75% mass loss, and then, but it's holding 50% of the carbon. And there it is, the, the car biochar is actually 75 to 90% carbon. Biomass, okay, so this is kind of the summary. Th these, and what I have underlined are the ways that it really helps climate change. Um, and that is the renewable energy, it's replacing fossil fuels with a carbon neutral energy. As a soil amendment, it's uh, holding the, the nutrients in water, but it's also raising the pH, making it more productive for plants. Less fertilizer is required as a result because it's also holding that. You know, what's the story with nitrogen? Nitrogen and phosphorus both. What is a major cause of the dead zone in the Gulf. Too much nitrogen and phosphorus that's running off of farmland in the Midwest. 
Nitrogen and phosphorus are very mobile and very dynamic. They do not like to stay in the soil where they are placed. They like to off-gas in the form of nitrous oxide off-gas, uh, nitrous oxide gas, and they like to move into streams. And that's very detrimental for streams. So, biochar, put that in streamside um, restoration. Not only will you improve the quality of the plants that are growing there and the productivity of the soil, but you are grabbing and holding the nitrogen and phosphorus before it gets into the water. That's exciting. Water quality enhancer. Just went over that. Another thing that, that biochar does is it holds heavy metals and toxins. You know, what do we put in our fish tanks? We put activated charcoal in the little filters so that we can grab any toxins or, or undesirable elements out of the water and keep the water fresh. Well, biochar is one step away from activated charcoal. Activated charcoal is when you take charcoal and you, you clean all the dust off it and you clean all the little particles so it has the maximum surface area. But biochar naturally has a, a lot of surface area. So even without activating it, it still holds a lot of those, those um, negative elements that we don't want to see in our water or soil. It raises the pH of soils. In Montana, that's not such a big problem, but there are other areas where a soil that is too acidic really compromises the growth of plants. So. Um, so that's another positive. And then on the climate change mitigation specifically, the sequestering of carbon for literally thousands of years. There is still carbon in the, the Amazon jungle soils where it was put by Amazonian Indians, which I'm going to tell you about next, which is really exciting. Um, and it's still there. It's still working 2,500 years later. So we know that it can be recalcitrant for at least a few thousand years. Minimizes greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. It reduces soil off-gassing of nitrous oxide by 50 to 80 percent. That's really huge. That's not just a little bit. That's a lot. And then it also um, increases plant growth and abracadabra. Plants growing more vigorously absorb more CO2. <sighs> Soils and plants. Putting the bio in the char. Uh, okay, who thought of biochar? Well, it wasn't us. It was, it was Amazonian Indians. The best we can piece together, it was Amazonian Indians. Well, how did we figure that out? Well, it took us a very long time to realize that, wait a minute, there were cities in the Amazon thousands of years ago. They were right in the jungle, and cities mean a lot of people, and a lot of people eat a lot of food. So how did these people get fed? Because they weren't just running around you know, picking fruits off trees. Jungle soils are no notoriously not a nutrient rich. They are actually just a platform. All the nutrients are in the living matter that sits on top of them. So they're not, they're not these fertile rich soils. So how did these people get fed year after year? There must have been something in the soil. So it was really anthropologists who started to tune into the fact that, wait a minute, we know that there's like these, all these roads, the, the ancient roads, and when we fly over them, we can see that all along the roads, these are these little nodes of very rich, verdant growth that looks different than the, the, so, the growth around it. So what's going on? We go on the ground and we look and we see that that soil is black. And the, then the other soil is a, a bright orange. So what happened? Was it just some natural little pod of dark soil? But why is it always along the roads? Why is it always near, civil, uh, near cities? Well, what they started to do after they, they began to investigate is that, that soil was simply jungle soil with a whole lot of char in it. There were pottery chards. There were, there were um, all kinds of evidence of human activity, but there was a lot of charcoal. And it went very deep. So that's how they were able to support large populations. Because as you know, slash and burn agriculture, which is being practiced all over jungles around the world, you're only going to be able to grow something there, or even, even grass for cattle, for McDonald's, um, will only be for, able to support any kind of growth for just three to five years at the most. And then you've got to move on, slash and burn something else. If you would, anyhow, it's very, uh, and I just found out today how they did it. Ask me later. OK. And ter these terra preta soils are still fertile. I got to go to the Amazon um, 
this past fall and visit Terra Preta sites. And I'm talking to permaculture practitioners and farmers, and they are on this Terra Preta land, and they said, you bet, this Terra Preta land is worth five times what that jungle soil is worth, and it is still highly fertile and still outproducing by a factor of five jungle soils. 2,500 years later, what a gift to future generations for us to improve the soil so that they could continue to use it and, and, and uh, enjoy its fertility and richness 2,500 years later. This is a, an actual live picture. Uh, this is a terra preta soil, and this is normal jungle soil. And they, they are that different. It's like, it's shocking. And the, that terra preta, um, uh, one of the uh, em, embarca, in, in, no, in Bapra. In Bapra, which is a, the, um, the Brazilian soil service, soil science group, um, dug four pits for us, eight feet deep. It was incredible, and they were perfect. But uh, that, that biochar was going down four feet or more in, in some of those pits. It was amazing. Um, and here's a, a, a photograph here of just a um, digging the soil. And this is the terra preta. And as you come down and, and get down here into 80 to 100 centimeters, you start to get into the regular jungle soil. But all, uh, from the top, you can see how it was very dark here and then slowly degrades to the, the normal jungle soil. But that's plenty of root zone. For, for fertility. So again, what does it do? In summary, attracts and holds water and nutrients. It, it reduces uh, nitrous oxide off-gassing. It prevents that nitrogen and phosphorus, which loves to run around, to, uh, keeps it at home. It raises the pH and sequesters carbon, and it improves the soil texture. It's really good on clay soils because it makes it more friable. On plants, it, uh, again, the, the nutrients and water are more available, less fertilizer is necessary. It's great microbe habitat. And, and as you probably know by now, that, that the mycelial world, that fungus and mushroom world, is phenomenal. And it is so important to the health of soil. They love to live in those little pores in the, in the biochar. And as a result, it improves plant growth. Sorry for the crappy picture, but uh, this, this was um, all you need to look at is the height of this corn, and um, this is in Colombia. And at the the rate of 20 hectare, 20 tons per hectare of biochar, look at the difference in the in the growth here. And it, you know, it, it's also in the vigor of the plant. It, it's really significant. And that's of course no biochar on the. The far side there. And this, okay, you have to have a science slide to make sure that I'm, I'm you know, keeping, keeping accurate with the science. And, and what this is just looking at is, is it really recalcitrant? Will it really stay in the soils? And the studies have shown that, that um, you do have a very high recalcitrant um, characteristic of biochars that are made with slow pyrolysis, that's at the, sl at the um, cooler temperatures, of 100 to 900 years. That's the half-life. And, and it's been shown that, that a half-life of 80 is sufficient to say that that's good enough for sequestering carbon. Um, and the carbon sequestration values. I just had to throw this in because um, I really want to underscore that if we had a carbon market, biochar would be black gold, literally. And, and we were um, at one point we're seeing um, the European market go for about $35 a ton uh, for CO2. And if a ton of biochar is worth about three tons of CO2, then suddenly you're talking about about $100 a ton just for the carbon sequestration, not for all the other benefits that, that accrue. And then renewable energy. These pyrolysis units operate, we, we say, you know, high, medium, and low temperature. Well, uh, low temperature, we're talking about 300 degrees centigrade is as low as you want to go, more likely 350 to 4. That's for biochar. If you want syngas, you're up to six or 700 degrees centigrade. So it's not exactly cool. So, but you're creating all this heat. What are you going to do with it? Heat is energy. You can use it for space heating, or you can use it to uh, convert to power. Uh, and again, the other um, substitute for fossil fuels that, that I, I mentioned, and also the putting the waste to use. And again, just the, the uh, yeah, that bunker fuel, boy, uh, 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 the bio oil is really, really um, impressive in its viscosity, shall we say. And, um, and syngas, you can pull it right off your, your uh, pyrolysis unit and put it in tanks for later use. Um, this is just looking at, th this always astounded me because I, I, thought, I thought it was a typo, but uh, it's not. Um, uh, there has been a, a 
um, an experiment, a field trial going on in Southern Oregon that the Forest Service has been conducting on the Umpqua National Forest in the Diamond Lake District. And they have been, um, they included a pyrolysis unit, a mobile pyrolysis unit, which is, is a, a cool thing because then you don't have to transport the biomass, you can take the unit to the biomass. And they, the um, biomass from timber sale they have been um, putting into this unit to get bio oil and they're getting out of a ton of slash they're getting 120 gallons of bio oil and that's pretty phenomenal and then it is possible as i said that you can refine it to a number two diesel and uh, but there is a caveat in that bio oil is heavier than water so if you have a spill in a stream or something the bio oil is going to sink right to the bottom immediately and uh, and so cleaning that up could be a problem and then minimal emissions. This is the actual emissions from the, the, the University of Montana's uh, Biomax unit. They actually have a, a, um, a demonstration unit that um, is for the generation of electricity from wood pellets. And uh, you can see here it complies with California air standards. Now, this is really something that I want to talk about, uh, biomass. We love it. We need it and we want it, but so do a lot of other people. And as energy prices increase, which they guaranteed will, um, there's going to be a lot of competition for biomass. And biomass to energy can be a good thing or it can be a very problematic thing, depending on if the biomass is treated and, and used sustainably, and if it is the appropriate biomass to use, if we are not cutting down native forests to create monoculture plantations to create biomass, then that is a good thing. But let's take a look at biomass, because this is extremely important. This is what we're depending on. So according to us humans, biomass is any carbon-based material which, when sufficiently dry, can be thermally converted to energy and other byproducts. It sounds great to an engineer, but what does nature call biomass? Biomass is a complex structure of nutrients, moisture, and temperature regulators providing shelter, food, homes, and carbon sequestration. Those two definitions are very, very different, and we are going to have to reconcile and, and honor those two definitions, particularly honoring the na nature's definitions if we want to be successful in using biomass sustainably. Biomass is really cool, and it's really cool in place. And one of the, the, the ecological functions in the soil, it's organic matter, it replenishes organic matter, it builds the soil, it protects the soil from wind and, and water erosion, and it has a strong role in the carbon cycle. Um, biomass in water, biomass is really integral to the, the hydrologic cycle because it moderates evaporation. If you have a bare piece of ground, you know it dries out and just turns to, to cracked mud if you don't have some kind of protection or cover. Likewise, when it rains, if, it's, if the soil is not covered, you get a lot of runoff, a lot of sedimentation. Um, biomass will also hold the snow and, and <clears throat> will slow spring runoff and you will, um, it also helps to moderate stream temperatures on, when it's on the stream banks. It's, um, it's very important as, as a source of food, shelter, and, and protection for animals and that's anything from you know, huge animals to little tiny microbes, um, thermal cover, nesting platforms, hiding cover. Um, Biomass and site ecology, it actually moderates the effects of wind. I mean, in, and wind can dry out soil, so it's not like wind is only in the treetops. It's along the, the, uh, the surface of the earth as well. And that, that biomass can break up that, that, um, that wind and, and prevent the, the uh, wind-driven erosion. And <clears throat> it also helps to hold snow, like a snow fence. You know, and, and, um, and that's really important for recharging soil water. And then um, it obviously influences moisture and patterns and, and the retention and distribution of that moisture. And again, it supports the mycelial functions above and below ground. So it's doing all that, and yet we want to use it for something else. So, you know, and, and the, the biochar community is really very, very concerned about the sustainability and the quality of the biomass that we're using. And 
We want to make sure that what we're doing first and foremost is intercepting the waste stream and not even using 100% of the waste because there's a very important function, as we just saw, of that biomass staying in place. So there's a certain amount of tons per acre. And, in, and I, I think in a, a dug fir habitat type, you might have uh, five tons per acre um, should be left on the ground. So leaving some on the ground, what else? What can we take off that's excess, that's concentrated, that is, is more more than the, the soil and the site needs. Um, pulpwood, if there's insect-killed trees, um, particularly dense concentrations of them. Forest slash and thinned materials that would otherwise just be piled and burned. Um, it, or if it's urban forest waste, that that would be taken to a landfill. Um, there are other uses for it, you know, the eco-composting and, and all that. But all of it doesn't get used. and Biochar can be really, really good solution if you have, uh, for instance, Dutch elm disease or some, some uh, tree disease where you do not want to allow that the residues from those trees to get back into the soil and re-contaminate um, the soil with that, that virus or, or um, disease. And so um, we know of, of instances where, where um, trees that have been infected with a, a, um, a contagion can be turned to biomass very safe or biochar very safely and the uh, and then not pollute but still be able to or not contaminate other soils and trees but still be able to be used um, and in in a rather gross example but but worth worth noting is that in Canada they are using pyrolysis units for um, treating roadkill uh, because of chronic wasting disease, that that actually the the high temperatures of, of pyrolysis will actually kill the prions that are in the brain that spread the the, uh, the chronic wasting disease. So, you know, not not uh, lovely to think about, but a a, a positive use of uh, of pyrolysis. Obviously, wood waste from processing, and I'll tell you about it in a very exciting conference that's coming up. Tricon. Um, Lumber is uh, in, in St. Regis is actually going to be one of our first biochar pioneers in uh, in Montana, and they're looking at the feedstocks of the not only the forest slash and waste that's close to them their 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 site, but also to use the wood waste that they from processing now in a much more efficient manner than they're currently using it in their just their their straight up hog fuel burners, um, manure. Sufficiently dry manure is great. And, and actually, we always are very careful to say that, that biochar is a soil amendment. It's not a fertilizer. Well, it can become a fertilizer over time as it draws nutrients and holds them. But when you put it in the soil, for most feedstocks that, that you, um, that from which you derive the biochar, you are only talking about a soil amendment. Now, where you get into the uh, biochar as a fertilizer is if you pyrolysize chicken litter, the bedding from, from poultry, because that is really rich with nitrogen and phosphorus, which is retained even through the pyrolysis process. So there, you actually have a fertilizer because you've already charged your biochar. That's given a lot of producers some exciting ideas because it's now, well, wait a minute. If we somehow charge this biochar with nitrogen or phosphorus or, or any other kind of nutrient, we can make it more potent more quickly. So people are trying uh, different mixes in there, putting um, fung uh, fungal spores into the char before it goes into the soil. Other people are using a more primitive but effective method, and that's putting the char in a bucket and peeing in it. And it uh, charges the, the, uh, the biochar quite nicely. Um, Agricultural crop waste, that's a biggie, and because there is a lot of agricultural crop waste, and not all of it is suitable for putting back into the soil. And sometimes you're just too, you're pounding and compacting the soil too much if you go over and over trying to, trying to get all that material back in. So that's, that's an important one. Uh, straw from bluegrass operations. And in the Pacific Northwest, they grow a lot of bluegrass, and they have a lot of straw left over from that. Um, and growing it for seed primarily. And any spoiled hay or straw that, that is molded or can't be fed to uh, wild li or, um, livestock can be used. Bagace, the residue from sugar production. Um, and you could argue that it's a better use of uh, um, corn stover and bagace. Perhaps it's a much better use to char it rather than try to uh, use it for ethanol. 
and uh, methane digester residue. It's gooey stuff, but if you mix it with other feedstock, you, can, you actually can create biochar. And there is another project um, just in the Flathead Valley that is uh, growing algae as a form of, of green power. And then they are uh, charring, they are converting the, the algae and, and um, wood waste to biochar. But again, intercepting the waste stream is key. Now, are there concerns? You bet there's concerns, and some very legitimate concerns. One is, of course, the use of food or animal feed as a feedstock. Ethanol. What did we discover about ethanol? Besides having a lousy uh, energy return on energy invested and, and, not, and having a very poor life cycle assessment result, that, that actually we were taking food out of people's mouths, that so we were causing prices to soar in Mexico for corn. Um, and so actually, the, um, in, in, oops, sorry. Uh, in Maryland, where I was helping them with their, um, develop their climate change action plan, those studies came out just as we were evolving towards the final plan. And, and we had a lot in there about biomass to energy. And they got very excited. And immediately, we altered the plan when we saw those studies so that um, they said that it, you could not use any biomass that was a feed or, or a food or animal feed as a feedstock. Another one is the concern about uh, converting cropland to grow biomass. Are we taking valuable land that could produce food uh, to, to grow some fast-growing species like poplar or something and then whacking it for biomass? Conversion of the conservation reserve program lands. You, went, you know, I thought, what an idiotic idea. Who would do that? Well, I'll tell you what. I ran across a lot of people who want to do that. And, you know, it's like, well, they're just sitting there. It's like, oh, good Lord, you know. <laughs> They're sitting there for a very important purpose. They're providing habitat. They're resting the soils. They're, they're, they're providing an important natural service by, by sitting there. So going in there with a, a large lawnmower type piece of equipment and shaving off most of the biomass is not a conservation reserve program goal. Industrial scale production or collection of biomass. That's another one that, that we really have to be very concerned about because people start to, to do the math, they see the economics, and they go, wait a minute, I could make a buck. So you know, we're going to make a large centralized um, uh, um, process here and suck in all this biomass. And this has been done a lot in developing countries. So it's not, um, you know, it's not a, a false concern. And it definitely needs to, to not happen. Um, the transportation carbon footprint and cost, that's another very legitimate concern. But we have had a couple of studies done now, life cycle assessment of, of, uh, of biomass to biochar. And it's still. Um, profitable, it still has a, a negative carbon footprint out to 200 miles. Now, we don't recommend that. You know, we say the closer the better, mobile units, smaller units, distributed units, so you're not dragging that biomass all over the place and creating, a, you know, offsetting your benefits of putting the carbon in the, in the soil by dragging your biomass, or bio, you know, your, your biomass around. And, you know, case in point, I had a, a, a guy working on a, a large grant that was going to require a couple of pyrolysis units. There are, then the, the technology is fairly nascent in the United States. States, but this fellow uh, was working with a, a, um, a company in Australia, and Australians are way ahead of us in biochar. They've been at it for years, but um, the, and they have great equipment. So he's trying to sell me a piece of a, a pyrolysis unit from Australia, and I said, "Are you nuts?" I said the the carbon footprint of dragging that unit from the other side of the world over to here will be completely negated by all the biochar I could ever produce and put back in the soil. So let's not get ahead of ourselves here. And so I'm waiting until they actually start to produce those units in the United States before I um, engage in a business manner with him. Um, ecologically unsustainable biomass um, removed from from crops and for or croplands and forests. You know, I've already addressed that. The, that biomass is serving an important function, and some of it needs to be left there in place. And very importantly, effects on visual quality and wildlife habitat. If you want to get shut down in a biomass removal project, make it look ugly. Ruin the wildlife habitat, and the public will not let you continue. 
And you know, we talk about the wildland urban interface. Oh, I'll save that for when I get to the wildland urban interface. Oh, here I am, the wildland urban interface. OK, this is really key to the biomass sourcing. And this is really, really important to me in my work in public land and, and, uh, and also my, um, my work in, oh, that was my hair. OK. Um, we're good to go. The social implications of biomass are why we live in the West. The wildland urban interface. Why do we move to the wildland urban interface? Because we like it. It's pretty. There's trees. We feel part of nature. The wildlife is there. We're out on our own, so we think. Well, that's really good. That's fine. I live in the wildland urban interface. I know it. I like it. But if you tell somebody, oh, you have dead trees in the wildland urban interface, we want to come and get them. It's like, ah, no. OK, because we want the lands that we move to. We want the lands that we look at right outside of our city, the, the lands that we recreate on because they're just so easy to get to. We want them to stay in character. We want the visual quality to be preserved. We want the wildlife habitat to be preserved. And we don't want to see them radically changed. But nature has radically changed things for us. Oops. Um, and this happens to be what I can see right from my property. Now, down here, you have this lovely example of dead, dead ponderosa pine that were killed by the mountain pine beetle. And then up here, if you look carefully, you can see there's a lot of gray up here. Those are dug fir that have been killed by the, the spruce budworm in one hillside. And where did one of my neighbors build? At the top of a chute with all these dead trees. <laughs> we call it the fire pit. <laughs> But, and, and this is the result, you know, wildfires. Now, that's not to say, and because there, there's, a, there's a, a studies out that are not, not necessarily supporting this concept that, you know, one match in the entire uh, forest from Butte to Helena will go up in smoke. Um, it could happen. We're not sure of how flammable that really is. Um, there's some dispute about how, how, um, how likely a strike is to start something. But I'll tell you what, when you fly from Butte to Helena, you see about 85 to 90% dead trees in a pretty solid mass. Pretty scary. So, it's fine to say you don't want change, but change has already happened. And what can we do something about this? Yes, we can. Um, and I'm, I'm going to pause here and tell a little story. Um, my property, as I said, is, is very close to this. I have 160 acres. And a lot of it died. And I had been taking really good care of it and very slowly restoring it all by hand. Well. Suddenly, I'm not talking about a tree here, a tree there. I'm talking about acres and acres of dead trees. So it's like, how confident do I feel about what I'm preaching? How confident do I feel when I tell somebody, oh, yeah, harvest your, tree, your dead trees in your front yard. It'll be fine. So I did it. I put 25 acres of a cutting unit all around my house, right up to my front door. But I worked with a guy who really understood what I was after. He's from Missoula, actually. If you want his name, I'll tell you later. Um, and that place looks great. It looked great right after the harvest. And I've, been, I've stored a lot of the biomass. I've, a lot of it has gone off. Um, but in the middle of my, my second harvest, I was doing an additional, um, I was going to do an additional 30 acres further down the ridge. But uh, 10 acres into it, Smurfit Stone closed. Smurfit Stone was the only place that was taking biomass. So suddenly there was no, no market, no place to even take the wood. And so um, I've actually been working with this guy for and developing some biomass to energy projects and hopefully will involve biochar. Um, but it can be done. These trees can be removed. But what a great source of biomass, because you're taking it away from people's homes where it could actually help those homes burn. And you know what happens if the homes burn? You know, I'd like to pretend that my only concern would be for people's property and their, and their physical health. But I have another concern. My secret concern is that if we get fires that burn in the wildland urban interface and destroy property and homes and possibly even people's lives, you know what folks are going to say? Cut them all down. 
build roads into the wildlands, build roads where there are no roads now, and cut down every dead tree because dead trees are evil. They killed these people, they burned down my house. That is not true. We, we should not, absolutely should not, road places to go in and get dead trees on the pretext that somehow that's going to slow or stop forest fires. You know, we're way past that point. And the, the harm that those roads will do over the centuries is much greater than what those trees standing there are going to do. So we don't want to get people excited and upset about dead trees that, that they feel would cause them great harm because otherwise we're going to have a knee-jerk reaction and it's going to be very difficult to argue that if, if there are, that they can point to uh, destruction and mayhem. So, what, what, how much biomass is really out there? Well, just taking some figures from the Forest Service. Um, in 2008, over 100 million tons of biomass were simply burned. Fuels reductions um, are typically, the, per acre, 10 to 40 tons per acre that the, they'd be removing. And the tons that are burned in wildfires, a typical year is 1.5 gigatons. So we have a lot of biomass out there. Even if we just squash it down to what's retrievable on, on existing roads and in the wildland urban interface, which might even be as little as 10 or 15 percent. But 10 or 15 percent of 1.5 gigatons, I'll take it. Okay, sustainable use of biomass. This is one of the reasons I started the U.S. Biochar Initiative, is so that we can put sustainability standards in place before we even start down that road. The most important one, I think, is reconciling the difference between that definition, uh, the definitions of biomass from what nature calls it and what we call it, and also recon recon reconciling the differences between perception and fact. The, the perception story that I just told you, that if people have fires in the wildland urban interface, they're going to want all the trees in the wildland, so in the backcountry, to be whacked. What is myth? What is fact? What are the ecological limitations? How much biomass can we take off that is just waste or excess versus how much needs to be left? And understanding the social limitations. People aren't going to let us just go out and, and wildly take biomass. And be very careful of this because as energy prices increase, which they will. We passed peak oil in 2006, so there's no going back. And if you want to read a very good book about coal, which I think our governor needs to read, called Blackout by Richard Heinberg, and this myth that we have coal, global coal supplies for 200 to 300 years is entirely bogus. You look at the data that are, exist, that our, our, our governments have put together, and we are probably going to see peak coal in less than 20 years. So if you don't think energy prices are going up in your lifetime, you are not paying attention. And when energy prices go up, people are going to turn to a source that is cheap and local. That sounds like forest biomass to me. So we need to get very serious very fast about ensuring that we protect our forests so that they are not raped and pillaged for biomass with people weeping and saying, oh, I have to keep my house warm. It's true, you do. But we better start planning for that now and not wait until the, the uh, the, the situation is dire. And education by demonstration. You know, I can stand up here and talk about biochar all day long, but if I take you to a site that has had biochar on it and show you a, site, a plot that ha doesn't have biochar, when you see that, then it sinks in. You... Hey, what time is it? Okay, I'm going to wrap this up pretty quick here. I think I'm close to the end. Um, sustainability. We're looking at renewability, availability, accessibility, and demand. All of those are coming to the fore with biomass, and that's going, to in, uh, that's going to lead us to a very high potential for overuse. And we need to pay attention to the physical, the biological, and the human dimensions of biomass and its sustainability, because they're all of equal importance. You know, I'm not going to read these. I think that I've integrated them into the discussion so far about the kinds of things that you need to do to ensure sustainability. But these are some of the physical ones that we need to do, you know, and, and including things like ensuring air quality. I mean, you can't have, have crapo pyrolysis units out there that are spewing emissions because you're going to be counteracting all the good that you thought you were doing. Um, and then the biological sustainability. Again, very important, what does the forest need? What do the croplands need? What does the soil need? 
nature knows a hell of a lot more about taking care of things than we do. And if we take away the tools and the materials that nature needs to ensure the productivity of Earth's surfaces, then we are in, in trouble. A really important one here um, that almost shut down the ability to use biomass as a renewable energy um, source for credit that was actually in a, in a bill in the Senate and the House um, was based largely on the, the uh, tree diameter class limits because there were a lot of people who believed that if you uh, gave incentives for biomass energy that the companies would start whacking down old growth and very large diameter trees. So um, a lot of us are, are uh, advocating for a self-imposed limit of, of three uh, or of, of six and maybe eight inches but smaller is better. Um, and so that we, we commit to not cutting down large trees for, for biomass. And then the human sustainability. Again, the land use changes, visual quality, the, the wildlife, all of these are extremely important. And if, if, we, don't, if we don't do this right, we won't be able to do any um, of the rest of the things that we would like to do with that biomass. And then um, just some education and, and outreach kinds of, of um, things that, that we would like to see happen. And one of those is what's happening on March 21st and 22nd out in St. Regis at the Community Center. Um, we're going to have a, a, a biochar discussion. Um, Tricon Lumber is, is, uh, is pivotal to that. This is part of a Mineral County de um, Development Challenge that's going on. And uh, so we're going to be looking at, at the markets and uses and, and materials and, and on a very site specific, i.e. right here in Western Montana. Um, and then on the 22nd, we'll be going out in the, in the field with Tricon looking at, at uh, what, what does biomass look like out there in the field and what have they been doing with it and what do they think they can do with it and also looking at in the context of, a, a, um, of mobile units. And that is the end. All right. All right, this is the fun part. In uh, harvesting your dead trees and stuff like that, uh, mm -hmm. no, no new roads, even any uh, temporary roads, what about helicopter, heavy helicopters pulling it down? Um, helicopter logging is extremely expensive. You could, I mean, if, if push came to shove, you could use that, um, or you could use it, um, you know, you could capture the, the biomass that was a result of, of, you know, somebody pulling off a log that, that had high value, but then taking off the limbs and the, and the tops and stuff. You could do that with the, but um, actually plucking out the dead trees with a helicopter. Yeah. No, not enough bucks in it for them to do it. Uh, Yes. Uh, yeah, the, the question was, uh, what, how did the Amazonian Indians get that biochar into the soil? You know, did they sit there and dig? You know, was it till, no till? Well, what was explained to me, and I, I like this theory because it really makes a lot of sense, is that in, in clearing, the, the Indians would go in to an area and, and try to fell all the trees into the center. And then they would plant in amongst those fallen trees for a year or so, but also throw any, any kind of uh, animal manure, their own manure, um, you know, whatever they had that was considered waste, throw that in on the pile. And then, then burn that, after a year or two, to burn that. And then, then start to work the soil, you know, uh, planting root crops and that sort of thing. So not actually like trying to put it in very neat and clean over every inch, but, but to just like start working little pockets of it and, and where it burned sufficiently and, and it was very crumbly and, and fine that they could just work it in in the course of, of you know, turning over the soil to plant in it. And they, so they would just keep working it um, and so it would work into the soil. Um, and that's, that's a very good question because to get the, bi the biochar into the soil, you do have to turn the soil over. 
to put it in the soil. Now I know of orchards in, uh, in Australia that are just top dressing with it and some of it gets into the soil. We're doing experiments um, on the Bitterroot National Forest and several other national forests of just broadcasting it and thinking that you know between wind and, and water erosion and, and animals walking around that it's going to kind of get churned in or, or get duff or additional duff layers on top of it. Um, so you know there's 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 pros and cons about getting it into the soil. The wind erosion, you know, it's it's not an easy material to work with because if it's really fine, you want to wear a mask, you want to be careful. Shipping it, it it can spontaneously combust. You know, so there's there's uh, issues with that. The and you have an additional question, so I'll pause. I was going to say. Okay. Um, the the um, one of the ways that that um, that seems pretty promising about getting the the uh, char into the soil is um, well actually two ways. One in, in a seed drill while you're seeding, you know that that you have the char mixed in with the seed, so it's going in right beside the seed. So it's a, a a specific delivery system, and you are going to be disturbing the soil anyhow, and you're only making one pass. Um, another way, if you're practicing a a, a form of no-till, but you are at least cutting a furrow to plant um, the, your, your um, next year's seeds that you can put char in as you, as you uh, slice that furrow. So. so. Yeah, the next question would be, is there uh, a need for uh, specialized equipment here that uh, might uh, change our, our equipment in the agricultural field? Um, the question was, is there a need for specialized equipment for application? We are trying really hard to avoid that and looking at what ways can we get this char in the soil without specialized equipment because everything that you add, every piece of equipment, every specialization adds a lot of cost. And, and you know, already farmers, and, and you probably are, know more about this than I do, but um, you know, already there's, it, it's a, a close to the margin operation for a lot of small farms and so adding more equipment particularly fossil fuel powered equipment is not that great of an idea so we're trying to to look at ways to use existing equipment mm -hmm. you. i think you bet uh, we're not like doing biochar at home is there any ways that oh yeah there is, um, and oh, I forgot. I forgot a really cool part of, of you know because we were talking about climate change. I didn't get into this part, but it's when I say scalable, I'm talking. You can make a unit that big out of old coffee cans that that will make a an, uh, um, an updraft stove that will really reduce the amount of emissions that come out, the amount of smoke, and produce biochar. And you know, there's there's a um, there's a lot of um, a lot of plans right on, on uh, online. Uh, the T LED stove, uh, top load downdraft or top load updraft stove, but uh, and World Stove, uh, a company out of Italy, uh, Nathaniel McCulley, is making these stoves that are about yo big. Uh, they just cost a couple of bucks, and um, the 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 focus is to get these stoves into the hands of people now that traditionally cook on wood, especially open fires in huts, in enclosed spaces. In Africa, women that cook over open fires, their life expectancy is 45 years old because they're breathing all the smoke and fumes and likewise it affects the health of their family. If you turn around and give them a stove, they can use their biomass more efficiently, use smaller pieces of biomass so they're not stripping their forests out and, de and causing deforestation because of their need for, for biomass. They can use manure and other kinds of fuels that they wouldn't normally use and they're not getting the smoke in their hut and when they're done, They've got char they can put in their soil and improve their soil. So yeah, they, and you can, I've seen units that are about that big, backyard units in, from Japan, um, I've, and you can build, I have a, a whole Adam retort program, which is building a retort that's about four by four by eight, that's a masonry unit that, that functions as a, as a biochar production unit. Um, so yeah, the sky's the limit on what you can build and what size and in your own backyard for sure. The gentleman behind you had a question. So if the biochar were embraced on an industrial scale, um, how would you address issues regarding 
certain niche species that require those ecosystems? Very good question. Um, I don't know that I can that I can tell you a how right now, but certainly that would be extremely important um, to assess before removing biomass, what's already there, and what are key indicator species of, of that, that habitat's health, and who else is relying on that biomass, and by who I'm talking um, animals or other plants. Um, but that, that's really a critical question. And, and um, I'm, I'm not sure how, except doing a, an assessment ahead of time and putting certain habitat types or, or um, not permitting the um, certain species um, or certain, um, I hate to say by species because what we're dealing with in nature are complexes. You know, a lot of interrelationships of things. And so um, understanding those interrelationships and making sure we know what we're doing and where we're going before we, we venture off to scoop in biomass. Very good. Um, I'm seeing, okay, uh, let me start and kind of do a sweep over this way. Um, yes? Uh, can you make petroleum byproducts such as like plastics and those sorts of things out of the biochar oil that's produced? <coughs> yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I don't know. That, I'm, go I'm, I'm going to try to find out. Um, <sighs> hmm. Worth investigating. Thank you. Um, Steve? Yeah. Um, Laura, I just wanted to add a little bit of a question on farm equipment because I was at the ag show a couple of weeks ago looking at this issue. Can you, can you speak real loud so everybody can? Speak real loud. I was at the ag show in Billings a couple of weeks ago looking at this issue and it looks like the standard no-till fertilizer application equipment can be used is, is pretty likely to be able to be used to apply biochar. It's about the same consistency, it's about the same size. You might very well, if you were in kind of a blended situation, apply fertilizer and biochar at the same time, and therefore probably have a lot less migration of the nitrogen out of the soil while you apply your fertilizer, thereby using less fertilizer and having a longer effect. Great, thank you. And in the back row. How do you compare biochar's energy cost well, I don't know that I can answer that specifically because I don't know the economics of, of third and fourth generation or fifth generation nuclear reactors, but I would love for Bill Gates to give me about 10% of the money that he's putting in there and spread that around for some distributed biochar production. Um, you know, the, the issue of what are we going to do with that nuclear waste has a cost. And I think Steve probably has an answer for us here. But, you know, it's that um, when, you're, when you're comparing cost, you've got to look at the triple bottom line. You've got to look at the economic cost, the social cost, as well as the, the standard economics. And what I'm concerned about with nuclear waste um, and nuclear energy production is we're not really looking at the in, entire social and ecological costs on a long-term basis. Steve? One of the simple measures is just your net economic throughput. And a problem with nuclear power is it's only about a one-to-one -one throughput. Whatever money you put in, you'll get about the same money back, which is actually a very, very low return on investment. Most of the biological processes are in the area of five to one. I don't know what it would be with biochar, but for every pound of biochar you get into the ground, you're going to get about an eight to nine fold return on net productivity that the soil will, will be enhanced by that factor. So at least on a rough back of the envelope that's uh, what you're looking a lot better. To answer a question, what fifth generation reactors are designed to use? are designed to completely use the waste cycle to maximize profit. And they are right now... Hey, can, I, I need to stop you because I can barely hear you. So, so what the generation reactors are being tested in are far cheaper and far safer and also far less waste and far less operation than most people in the world. The the thorium, potassium cycle reactors. Okay, what, what this gentleman is saying is that fifth generation nuclear reactors are far cheaper, 
um, and correct me if I'm wrong, and, and create far less waste and are far more efficient than other generations. I say that's wonderful, but I still don't know how that compares um, you know, to, uh, in, in terms of, of its safety and, and, um, and the, the waste issue. So far less is good, but, how, but what does that mean? If you start off with this much and you end up with that much nuclear waste, it's still nuclear waste. Um, but again, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know um, how to even compare that. There, were, there was another question, I think, in the back. Yes, green shirt, yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering what you saw as the potential, for, if biochar has the potential to have like large global scale implications on um, sort of a, a carbon sequestration basis, like do you see it having the ability to have make a dent in the global scale of our sort of CO2 problems? There have been uh, a couple of studies done looking at uh, the, you know, um, net productivity and uh, amount of biomass that might be available and what could we, po uh, you know, how much we could possibly char. And, um, they came up with some pretty high figures, but there's a lot of question about to what extent have other factors been considered, um, you know, like other uses of biomass or the, how much nature needs. So um, there is a report online that's available on my website, um, the biochar-us.org, called U.S.-Based Biochar Report. And there is a chapter in there that's specifically devoted to uh, an assessment and analysis of the total amount of biomass available and how much carbon could be sequestered um, if that biomass was turned into, into um, biochar. So that would be the comprehensive answer if you would turn to that. I, I, don't, I, can, I think I can remember some figures, but I'd rather not say if I don't remember entirely or accurately which could it very well happen. Yes? Um, are there any facilities that are in the process or even in the mind of starting up a biochar facility in the Helena area, given that we have that landscape of mm -hmm. restoration mm -hmm. that's being planned? Well, we, we do have, there's, there's a lot of plans. And um, unfortunately, we're constrained by a lack of money. And um, we have been looking for, we and others that I know of have been looking for funding. I just met with a gentleman this morning here in Missoula that would like to see uh, a plant in Missoula. Um, I know there are a number of plants that are in Colorado. Uh, again, you know, the, with the impetus of all these dead trees, there's a lot of, a lot of interest in that. Uh, I don't know of any that are, are about to come to fruition. Um, again, a lot of it is, is um, finding the, the, uh, the dollars for the initial investment. Follow up to that, the, the Tricon is um, exploring this. How, what about a company like Pyramid? Um, Pyramid has looked at that also. Um, Pyramid is involved in, they operate out of Sealy Lake and um, they are involved in the Blackfoot Stewardship Challenge and I have met with them and, and talked with them about biochar. They're very interested but they need to be uh, very nimble and move when they can find the technology that's going to work best for them. Um, they are looking at district heating from biomass. Uh, they are looking at, at biomass to energy to produce electricity. So they're, they're, they're aware, they're interested, but I, I, one of our constraints is that, our, again, our technology is rather nascent. About the, we, we have a company in Colorado that has been building uh, these units for uh, about five years now, and they're getting really good. Um, but again, you know, uh, most investors are hesitant to put them in until they can see some in action, so we need to see more in action. And, and most of them are in the beta stage right now. But we're trying. Yes? Um, I would like to know if all of those products, including that bunker oil particularly, are ultimately biodegradable. Yes, they are. You, you mentioned how heavy it was and sitting on the bottom of the water. Yeah, it, 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 uh, it's, it is biodegradable, but it's, it's gooey. You know, that's, I'll tell you that. Um, yeah. Oh, hey. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just, uh, I couldn't quite tell from your description of how they work 
if you have a unit that you're using to produce the charcoal type of product, do you also get a little bit of gas and a little bit of oil, or, or is what you get very specifically related to temperature? What you get is pretty specifically related to temperature. And if you're trying to produce char, you really don't want oil coming out too. Now you can, you, you can design a system so that the oil will precipitate out, you know, the condensate. You can get that out before it gets, the, it gets into your char. But you, you know, the, it's the bane of, of biochar makers if they don't want the bio oil. And so they really play a lot with the temperature to prevent that. The syngas, you're always going to get some syngas, but that can be looped right back into the, in, uh, and used as process heat to continue the, uh, making the, the char. So there's a lot of emphasis on trying to keep things um, pretty well differentiated. And, and frankly, the, the, the char that you get from um, a high temperature gasification when you're going for the syngas, which makes the best energy um, or electricity production, um, the char that you get tends to have a, a pretty high pH, or pretty low pH actually. It's more acidic than, than uh, low torfication char. And it um, and you don't get very much. You maybe get 10% of the original volume. And so it's really not practical to try to get a little bit of all three. You just better decide what you want and then go for it and, and, uh, and try not to have the others um, in, the, in that same run you know, to, to uh, ball up the works. Yes? <coughs> what is the percent efficiency of the biochar and the biomass producers? Percent efficiency in terms of, of energy released or heat or in terms of turning the energy source into useful energy, turning the wood, biomass, biochar. Yeah, that's just what I was wondering. I'm not really sure I understand the question. I mean, I, I I hear what you're saying, but but in terms of measurement, um, uh, it, it, like a BTU, uh, and compared to what? Um, you know, I, 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 I'm, can anybody in the audience help me? I mean, um, the, um, she was asking about the efficiency. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, energy return on energy invested? Uh, if, if we look at it in terms of EROI, it's got a very good EROI. I don't know what the numbers are, but we look at that in the life cycle assessment and we come out um, very positively in a life cycle assessment. But let me, I, you know, I, I threw in a few slides in case I was asked complex questions. <laughs> Versus energy trade-off. This might be in here somewhere. Well, still not. It's giving us some comparisons, um, or at least you know how much stuff we're getting. But it's. I don't really see a, an energy return on energy invested. I don't know. That's a, that's some. That's very good. I, I will have to. Um, Take a look at that. Well, probably the closest you could find would be a conversion to propane or natural gas. Because um, then you, mm -hmm. you, you can see you know, energy into you know, energy. So mm -hmm. the, the other products you know, kind of muddy it. Yeah. The, um, and also your feedstock, because you get different you know, it, it takes a different amount of energy to move and process different kinds of feedstock and, and, then, and then whatever fuel you're using to start your process. So there's a lot of factors in there, but it would be very interesting. Thank you for asking that question. I guess uh, I'll, I'll posit that to, uh, to my compatriots and see if, if we can come up with some kind of um, some clarity, you know, at least outline some assumptions and say based on X, Y, and Z, then this is your energy return on energy invested. 
people Thank you. about lifestyle, but you've got to put time in there. It's not immediate gratification. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, he was saying that time is a very big factor to consider also in the life cycle assessment. And um, you, you folks have been very patient, so I'm going to go back. Um. Uh, thank you. One of our uh, state representatives, Joe Reed, recently introduced legislation that uh, I see from your face you're familiar. Um, that, yeah, this <laughs> legislation that basically uh, just states that global warming is actually beneficial for uh, Montana's economic climate and that he encourages increased uh, carbon emissions. And I was just curious if you could elaborate that on a little bit more and maybe, I, I, I think it sounds preposterous, but I'm just curious exactly what he's driving at there or how in what way could be beneficial to apply down. Um, I don't My twin, evil twin sister and I are fighting over who's gonna speak about this. <laughs> Her name is Prudence. <laughs> And her language is incredible, but uh, um, I don't know if we're going to let Prudence talk tonight because she might say things that are inappropriate. Um, okay, how do I say this? Uh, I think preposterous is a, a correct word. Um, this is a, this apparently has grown out of a um, a choice to ignore science, um, to ignore hard evidence. Um, it is unconscionable because the effects of climate change on people and on species in many cases will be extirpation. Prudence says dead. But to so blithely say that science means nothing that you might as well say gravity doesn't exist. I choose not to believe in gravity. Who didn't turn off their cell phone? Prudence. Damn it, turn off your cell phone. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there are actually websites out there that give, that, that provide templates for legislatures, legislators who choose not to exercise any intellect or moral integrity and just copy these templates, fill in the names of their states, and call it legislation of the people and by the people. And that is, to me, the highest offense. As a former public servant, um, I think they should be jailed for that kind of behavior, for even suggesting that. Because what they are simply suggesting is, we don't care if other people die. We don't care if species die. We don't care if civilization even survives, because we will make a profit in the next year or two. And even that's not correct. So thank you, Prudence, for being quiet. <laughs> So how about we pass some legislation on spear chucking? <laughs> yeah, I'd like to spear ch oh no 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 prudence down girl. <laughs> yes, Anne. The um, the new program on environmental journalism, we went over and over this. What do you do with somebody like this? And what we what we talked about and what seems to be the consensus is that what you should do is uh, report on the villages that are sinking in the uh, uh, north of the Arctic Circle. In other words, report on the actual things that are happening that reflect what's going on, and don't get into this. Global warming exists. Don't don't take them on. Just simply report all of the adverse circumstances. Talk about the glaciers that don't don't exist or almost gone in, in Glacier National Park, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's very, very obvious. Um, <coughs> uh, the, the, oh, it's just endless. endless mm -hmm. uh, things. And so that, that's what we're doing. Well, and, and it's very difficult. I think that's great advice, Anne. Um, be, and it's very difficult not to get into this political fervor and start trying to argue with these people or, because this is all theater for them. 
This has, it, it, it doesn't really matter whether it's true or not. They get a lot of press attention and their, their conservative comrades applaud them and you know, off they go. They, they have their ego stroked and, and there you have it. Um, but Anne is very right in that just talking about what's actually happening, we don't have to predict. I was just speaking with a reporter the other day, a journalist, and, and said, you know, it's sad. And it, it, it upsets me because I think back 20 years ago of all the predictions that those of us in the environmental community were making, and they're all coming true, or they all have come true, they're all out there, and you know what, we get a warm, fuzzy feeling for saying, I told you so? No, we, we feel really bad because nobody's paying attention now anyhow. And it's not a model, it's reality. And the reality that we're seeing, as you say, in the, in the Arctic Circle, you know, uh, uh, the Shishmarif and, and a number of those, those, um, those uh, Alaskan towns that are literally you know, falling into the ocean, you know, we, uh, the, political uh, the political theater. Why was I in Alaska helping them develop a climate change action plan? Because my, yeah, my organization and, and the organiz an organization I work with called the Center for Climate Strategies were invited. We were invited to come to Alaska to help them do a multi-stakeholder, citizen-based climate change action plan for mitigation and adaptation. Why were we there? Under what authority were there? We were there for an executive order signed by the current government, governor at the time. Her name was Sarah Palin. And sh that executive order was poetic in its description about the things that were actually happening in Alaska that were threatening people's lives, people's property, and our grandchildren's future with her signature on it. And how come a year later she's on television saying she doesn't believe in, in climate change? What happened to that poetic executive order begging us to come and help her state develop a climate change action plan? It's pure politics. And I go back to my, my statement of, you know, when, when you allow pure politics to move you to choices and you encourage people to make choices that are deleterious to life, that are conducive to death, that is a high crime. Question over here. Last question. Was there, oh, okay. Oh, we have one, yeah, we'll do one more. I need another question. Oh, okay. Uh, you mentioned that book on coal. Uh huh. What was the title of the book? Blackout. Yeah, Richard Heinberg. And are there any countries that are leading in terms of biochar? Where do, where do they do that? Yeah, Australia is one of the leaders in biochar. China. Uh, is, is moving up to the fore. They're getting very excited. They've been doing it in Japan for a long time. Africa, there are a lot of places in Africa are really moving forward with biochar. Um, you know, looking at agricultural waste like uh, coconut shells or husks and nut shells and husks. And, and so, um, and India is stepping forward. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a large generating plant in Japan. So um, other countries are, are really going, going uh, great guns with, with biochar. And people say, often ask me, why isn't biochar, if it's so cool, why isn't it happening in the United States? Well, we didn't think of it. So, you know, it's not cool. It's not good enough. You know, but, okay, fun fact before I go. Uh, Anne mentioned about, about glaciers. Do you know, I, I just read this. I love, I love cool facts. Um, the glaciers in the Himalayas provide water to half the population of the planet. Ha 500 million people depend on water from the Ganges. It's like, oh my god, that's a lot. So, when those glaciers disappear, to the global warming that's not happening and beneficial to Montana, there's going to be a lot of people who, who suffer the ultimate and pay the ultimate price for that. Thank you so much for your attention. Appreciate it.